Hello and welcome to my presentation of our paper, Not all code are create to equal. In a nutshell, I study an unintended way to change the code of a smart contract. My name is Michael Fröwis and I'm a PhD student at the University of Innsbruck in Austria. This research is joint work with Rainer Böhme. In our paper, we measure the impact and use of a change to the Ethereum execution environment. Ethereum is the most popular smart contract platform, which manages virtual assets in the order of 350 billion US dollar. Given the stakes involved, you can imagine that every change to this platform requires a lot of scrutiny. In Ethereum, all major upgrades have names. We focus on the Constantinople upgrade that went live on February 28, 2019. This upgrade implemented several Ethereum improvement proposals, short EIPs. Most importantly, it added five new instructions to the Ethereum virtual machine. Our paper looks at one of these, called Create2. So what is Create2 good for? The Create2 instruction offers an alternative way to set up a new smart contract. Before that, the create instruction without the two was the only way to do that. The difference between create and create two is how the address of the new smart contract is calculated. Recall that the address is the unique identifier of all accounts on Ethereum. Confusing addresses can mean losing a lot of money. The rationale behind introducing a new way for calculating addresses is pretty involved. It allows for the counterfactual instantiation of a smart contract. This lets users pre-commit to deploy a piece of code to a specific address without immediately claiming this address, meaning to actually deploy code. This motivation becomes apparent when you start to parse the Ethereum improvement proposal. Create 2 allows interactions to be made with addresses that do not yet exist on chain but can be relied on to only possibly eventually contain code. Of course, not any code, but code that has been created by a particular piece of init code. Keep in mind that we are now dealing with different kinds of code. I'm, I'm explaining this later. Now to the last fragment of this quote. Important for state channel use cases that involve counterfactual interactions with contracts. Here the authors speculate that counterfactual instantiation could simplify the adoption of state channels, an often advertised scaling solution. However, our measurements are not primarily motivated by this intended use case of the new instruction. Rather, we are interested in understanding its presumably unintended side effects since they raise security concerns. I think this forum post summarizes it pretty well. Create2 allows contracts to change in place after being deployed. The post continues with technical details. This is because although Create2 includes a hash of the init code in the address generation, the same init code could intentionally generate arbitrary contract code. Mind that init code popped up again. The next sentence articulates the concerns. Users interacting with a seemingly benign contract earlier could suddenly be interacting with a newer contract at the same address, which implements a completely different, potentially malicious functionality. This is fascinating for a number of reasons. First, by allowing in-place updates, create two breaks, a well-known invariant of the Ethereum platform. Code hosted at an address can never change. Every way to update code before a Constantinople upgrade relied on changing references to accounts. This technique is also known as the proxy pattern. Second, the update functionality itself is a side effect. None of the advertised use cases depend on the update feature. The only justification we found for allowing this unintended side effect was efficiency. Third, it becomes impossible to tell if a contract can be updated by looking at its source code. By contrast, the old way of using the proxy pattern is very apparent in the source code. 
for updates with create2, neither the source code nor the compiled bytecode do reveal if updates are possible. All this called for a systematic study. Before we can advance to our measurement method and results, let me explain how updates work on a slightly more technical level. So how can one use create2 to update code hosted at a particular address? The first thing we need to understand is how addresses are calculated when a new contract is created. If we create a new smart contract with the legacy create instruction, the address of the new account is derived from the address of the deployer and the nonce. Both are combined deterministically by some encoding, hashing, and the truncation to 160 bits. The nonce is a monotonic counter as defined by the protocol. Every transaction increments this counter by one. The nonce guarantees that the address calculation is never invoked with the same arguments. This makes address collisions very unlikely. When create2 is used to create a new contract, its address is calculated differently. With create2, the address does not depend on the monotonic count anymore, but on a seed and the hash of the initialization code. One important difference here is that all arguments of the address calculation function can be controlled by the user. This means that address collisions can be triggered on purpose by using the same values for deployer, seed, and init code in two different transactions. So what happens when such a collision occurs? Actually, not too much. In preparation for create2, EAP 684 was implemented it mandates that transactions creating such a collision have no effect. But there is a way around that. Ethereum supports a way to delete accounts by invoking the instruction self-destruct. By first deleting the account, we can circumvent the check introduced by EAP 684. This allows us to reopen an account that was deleted before. We call this a resurrection. A careful observer might say, but create forces us to commit to the code of the account in such a way that the address would change if the code changes. That means we can only reopen the same account, but we cannot change its code. Unfortunately, this is not true. To understand why, we need a short excursion into how deployments work on Ethereum. If we create a new smart contract, regardless whether with create or create2, we have to provide the so-called initialization code. It is responsible for setting up the new account. This includes setting up an initial state to values in storage, like the owner in our example here. Now, two things are crucial to understand code updates via create2. First, the return value of this initialization code is the actual program hosted at the address. And second, the initialization code is not restricted to setup values. Like any code running on the Ethereum virtual machine, it can communicate with its environment. So how do we use the last two observations to enable code updates via create2? Let's go through an example. This initialization code here returns different values depending on the state of its environment. Here, the block number. Before block 1 million, this code would initialize the account with program A, return in line 6. After that point in time, it would deploy program B, return in line 3. Observe that the program stored in the new address changes, but the initialization code is the same. Therefore, the address stays the same if the seed and deployer are held constant. A necessary but not sufficient condition for code updates via create2 is that the return value of the init code depends on the environment. We call code that is not dependent on the environment static. With this knowledge, we are in a position to draw a decision tree. Let's assume we want to know if our contract 0x that beef can update its code. The first and obvious question is, was it created before the Constantinople upgrade? If so, we are fine. The code hosted at the address cannot change. If it was created afterwards, we must check if it was created using the create2 instruction. If it's not created by create2, then it gets more complica complicated. 
There are situations where contracts created by the legacy create can be overwritten. In the interest of time, let's assume these edge cases do not exist. Our paper, of course, has all the details. Resurrections only work if the account can be deleted. This means a self-destruct instruction must be reachable in the program. If all the conditions are fulfilled up to this point, we call the account resurrectable. The last question is if the init code is static or not. Only if it's not static that it can return different values depending on the state of the environment. I'm sure you agree that it would be a bit too much to expect that every user goes through this checklist before interacting with a smart contract. Given that the side effects of CREATE2 are rather far-reaching and unanticipated, we asked ourselves, how relevant is this in practice? We ran me a measurement study using data from two months before the Constantinople upgrade until the 13th of July 2021, just before the London upgrade. We set out to measure two things. First, we look at the actual updates that were carried out. Measuring the actual updates executed using CREATE2 is straightforward. Whenever we encounter a, su a successful deployment transaction that creates an address which has been populated before, we have found an instance. Second, we tried to measure the potential for future updates. So which contracts fulfill the necessary conditions for an update via CREATE2? This is the question cautious users should ask before entrusting value to smart contracts. Let's first look at the simple case, accounts that have witnessed resurrections. The graph shows that they were rarely used until the beginning of 2020, afterwards it took off. In total, we have counted around 220,000 resurrections in our two years observation period. What is odd that almost all resurrections redeployed exactly the same program as the account hosted before. Only around 200 resurrections on 41 accounts actually updated their code. We did not expect to see so many resurrections that do not change code. Why would anyone pay transaction fees to create an account and delete it? Only to create the exact same account again. To gain some insight, we looked at the code that was deployed in those cases. Only 60 different programs were used in all resurrections. And only four programs made up about 90% of all resurrections. Looking at those four programs revealed that they were all gas tokens. In a nutshell, gas tokens offer ways to hedge against gas price variation. We found that gas tokens exploit the more predictable addresses of CREATE2 for efficiency, meaning to save gas. We also looked closer into the 41 accounts that changed their code via CREATE2. All of the accounts are opaque and we didn't find source code for any of them. But the volume and value of ESA and tokens they handle is significant. Tags and comments on ESA scan, as well as some community sources regarding minor extractable value and front running suggest that many of the addresses belong to front running infrastructure. Many of these accounts use vanity addresses, which indicates tech-savvy users and suggests that the accounts are meant for longer-term use. While we could not fully untangle the exact purposes, we conjecture that create two, the CREATE2 update method makes front-running bots slightly more efficient. This is plausible as it requires less indirection than, say, the proxy pattern. If you want to dig deeper, please look at the list of our reverse engineering results in the appendix of our paper. Now let's turn to the question of anticipating potential future updates. This is more involved because it depends on the entire deployment history that is not readily available. The most challenging part is to decide if code can self-destruct or whether the return value of the init code is static or not. We propose simple heuristics for both conditions. Concerning self-destructs, we simply look for the presence of indicator instructions in the bytecode. Obviously, this approach is not accurate. For example, in cases where the self-instruct instruction exists, 
in the bytecode, but is not reachable in its control flow. Note that our heuristic overestimates the possibility for updates. They avoid false negatives as they can be much more problematic in our case than false positives. A false positive would potentially lead to a user interact with a risky account, whereas the opposite would only prevent a potentially safe interaction. We deem that being conservative here is a responsible choice. Here you can see the number of deployments per day. It stays pretty constant between 10,000 and 100,000. In total, we observe 32 million accounts created since the upgrade. In orange, we see the about 14 million contracts that were deployed with Create2 and contain a self-destruct. This means they can potentially be resurrected. Observe that the usage of Create2 picked up in 2020 and dominates in 2021. This picture changes only slightly when filtering out gas tokens. When interpreting this, it is important to mind the log scale. In plain numbers, more than two thirds of all resurrectable accounts belong to gas tokens. Finally, and most interesting in my opinion, are resurrections that can change the code of an account. In red, we can see the around 100,000 accounts which our heuristic identified as having the potential to change their code in the future. This leads us to a summary. It may still be new to some that Ethereum smart contracts can be updated in place. This feature did not exist before the upgrade and violates an often cited invariant of the system. Updates are enabled by a side effect of the create to instruction. We also seen that the circumstances under which this is possible are pretty complicated and in fact not trivial to review automatically. In contrast to other patterns for code updates used on Ethereum, updatability is not apparent from the source code. Regarding the use of Create2 and updates via Create2, our measurements show that updates are rare. Mainly tech-savvy users like the creators of apparent front-running bots make use of it. Our method to check the updatability has identified an upper bound of 100,000 accounts within the two years that potentially put naive users' funds at risk. Cray2 also offers more predictable addresses. The main beneficiaries are guest tokens and wallet contracts. If you want to learn more about those and a few other use cases, I would like to encourage you to read the paper. What remains is that none of these use cases depend on the update feature. Our take home messages are twofold. First, we highlight that users are in dire need for reliable ways to check if code remains immutable. It appears striking to us that especially smart contracting platforms makes this unnecessary complicated for little apparent benefit. Second, given the value at stake on such popular platforms like Ethereum, and the potential impact of changes to the platform's fundamental logic calls for more research on platform upgrades as well as their governance in general. We are only aware of a handful of papers that directly measure the effects of protocol changes. Thank you for watching.